So good morning and welcome to Comcare's first National Safe Work Month webinar. I'm Megan Buick, General Manager Strategic Partnerships and Engagement Group, and with me is Justin Napier, General Manager of Comcare's Regulatory Operations Group, and we're going to be your hosts for today's event. Firstly, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we are virtually meeting today. I'm in Melbourne, so I would like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, the traditional custodians on this, of this land, and pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. I acknowledge the contribution they make to this nation, and I extend that respect to all Indigenous Australians and Torres Strait Islander people attending this event. Welcome. National Safe Work Month is held annually during October and aims to raise awareness and enable discussion about safety at work. This initiative is driven by Safe Work Australia and supported by work health and safety jurisdictions across the nation, including Comcare. This year, Comcare has a series of activities for Safe Work Month. We are delivering three keynote webinars that are centred around weekly themes, today being the first and I'll share a little bit more about these webinars towards the end of the session as well. So the theme for this year's Safe Work Month is no safety, work safely, make safety a priority. Knowing safety, working safely and prioritising safety requires us to get together with our co-workers and develop a shared understanding of what this means in each of our workplaces. To that end, we have de developed a do-it-yourself guide that provides a starting point to host your own safety activity or conversation with your colleagues. The guide steps through some considerations for planning a safe work month activity and presents some conversation starters to commence meaningful discussions about health and safety in your workplace. It is available to download on our website and I encourage you to, to do so. Also, for those of you within the Comcare scheme, we are going to be holding in-person events around the country. You can download the guide or register for those events on the Safe Work Month page, and the link is going to be sent through in the chat. Comcare's webinars bring together a wide variety of people from across the Comcare scheme and those from other work health and safety jurisdictions. For those of you attending for the first time, thank you for joining us. And for returning attendees, welcome back. It's great to have you with us. Before we start on today's webinar topic, we need to first acknowledge some of the circumstances we have been through over the past few years. For many of us, our workplaces look very different. There has been change in how we work, where we work and the way we work, including the introduction of new technology. There have also been major social and economic impacts that we are all experiencing in one way or another. As we continue to live with the pandemic, some people have also experienced the effects of fires and floods, and the impacts continue to be present, and there may well be trauma that is impacting our workers, colleagues, and stakeholders. So we need to be preparing for future challenges and risks. A safety-focused workplace should have an agile and dynamic work health and safety management system that enables organisations to respond to change, manage risks as they arise, and provide opportunity for consultation. This is also key in creating a strong safety culture. Today's webinar will provide an update on the model laws and the psychosocial code of practice, showcase current and upcoming resources, and highlight insights from data that has informed our programs of work and initiatives. We will conclude with a Q&A session to address questions submitted at the registration. I also encourage you to continue to ask anything further via the Q&A tab on your screens and we'll endeavour to answer these um, at the end of the session. We really hope today's session is enjoyable and provides you with some valuable insights that you can take back to your workplace. The information and resources we share can support you to creating a safer and healthier workplace. And it is with great pleasure that I welcome and introduce Justin Napier. Thank you, Megan. Hi, everyone. Great to have you with us today. Um, Justin Napier is my name, General Manager, Regulatory Operations Group at Comcare. I'm joining you from Melbourne too and acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations. Before I start going into detail, I am aware that many people joining us today are from a range of workplaces. So please note that we're speaking to specific aspects relating to the Comcare Work Health and Safety Jurisdiction. 
So some items may not be applicable to you if you are not in the ComCare scheme. I recommend you refer to your local work health and safety regulator if you're unsure. So let me begin by providing an update on the work health and safety laws. So by way of background, the model WHS laws were developed by Safe Work Australia in 2011 as a nationally consistent framework to provide for the health and safety of workers and workplaces. These model laws have been adopted by most Australian jurisdictions. Comcare is the regulator for the Com Commonwealth jurisdiction and each state and territory also has a WHS regulator who's responsible for compliance and enforcement in those jurisdictions. The Commonwealth adopted the model laws in 2011 with the Act taking effect from 1 January 2012. So this is the 10th year of the Commonwealth Work Health Safety Act, which applies to all APS agencies and around 30 self-insured licensees. So we can total cover around 440,000 workers in Australia. In 2018, the model WHS laws were reviewed to examine how they were operating in practice. So this review, often referred to now as the Boland Review, resulted in 34 recommendations. While the final report found that the model WHS laws were largely operating as intended, the report made recommendations to improve clarity and consistency, including undertaking further review and analysis in certain areas. And today I'll focus on the recommendations that address psychosocial injury in workplaces. So let's start with a model code of practice for managing psychosocial hazards at work. This was published in August this year by Safe Work Australia, and it can be found on the Safe Work Australia website. At this time, the code has not been adopted in the Commonwealth jurisdiction. We are awaiting approval by the Commonwealth Minister and for it to be registered on the Federal Register of Legislation. Comcare will keep you up to date on our website and via our e-news subscription service when the code is updated. And there's a link in the chat uh, function now to that, uh, that service. Also this year, SWAR amended the model WHS regulations to add regulations relating to the management of psychosocial risks. These proposed regulations can also be found on the Safe Work Australia website. And again, these have not yet been adopted by the Commonwealth, so they do not currently apply across the Comcare jurisdiction. As each jurisdiction must adopt the changes through their own legislative processes, please check with your relevant regulator the status of these amendments. In addition to the code and regs, further changes to the Model WHS Act are proposed. And these include the addition of gross negligence to a Category 1 offence, new industrial manslaughter provisions, and amendments banning the use of insurance to cover against WHS Act infringements and penalties. Again, Comcare will update when these take effect. Work is also progressing through SWA to review the incident notification provisions relating to psychosocial injuries. This is likely to result in changes to the incident notification provisions for PCBUs, requiring the notification of psychological injuries and illnesses. So further information is available from Safe Work Australia in relation to that notification change, and we understand a regulatory impact assessment process will occur. Now let's have a closer look at the model code of practice for managing psychosocial hazards that's been developed by SWA. Just to be clear, this is not yet adopted by the Commonwealth jurisdiction. However, under Section 30 of the Commonwealth WHS Act, PCBUs have a responsibility to manage health and safety at work, and the Act very clearly defines health to include psychological health. Furthermore, Part 3.2 of the WHS regulations applies to psychological hazards. So my message is that workplaces need to be managing psychosocial health now. I would hope that all PCBUs are currently assessing psychosocial risks within the workplace and are implementing effective risk controls in accordance with your WHS duties and obligations. Although SWAR's model code of practice is not adopted in the Comcare jurisdiction, it can still be utilised now by PCBUs, officers and workers to assist in the psychosocial risk identification process and to design controls to those risks. So the code identifies 14 psychosocial hazards and these are listed on the slide at the moment. 
These hazards can arise at work in relation to the design or management of work, the working environment, plant at a workplace, or workplace interactions and behaviours. The SWA code is a practical resource that will assist those with a duty of care to assess psychological, psychosocial risks in the workplace and to implement measures to manage those risks. In addition, SWA has released complementary supports, including helpful infographics, and we've provided links to these resources in the chat. Now, to support you, Comcare has just released three micro learns that will provide an overview of the code of practice, explain the various psychosocial hazards, and step you through psychosocial risk management. These micro learns are free to access, and they're on our website through our LMS, our learning management system, and they take less than five minutes each to complete. So I encourage you to have a look for these, share them with your colleagues, and start uh, familiarising yourself with the code of practice. Now we know uh, that for many organisations, identifying and managing psychosocial hazards in the workplace can be more challenging than managing physical hazards. It need not be so. The psychosocial risk management approach involves the same process as risk management of any other hazard. That is, identify the hazards that are present, assess and control those risks, and continually monitor and review both the hazards and the controls. So I encourage you to review the model code of practice and consider which of the psychosocial hazards might exist in your workplaces. You may also want to use validated psychosocial risk assessment tools, such as people at work, and that's referenced on your screen now. This tool can help you to better understand the psychosocial hazards that exist in your workplaces. You need to be mindful though, that people at work can only be done with a minimum of 20 responses or participants. Remember, you, you need to consult your workers also, as they have first-hand knowledge of these risks and hazards. Consultation with workers will also assist in developing risk controls through, for instance, changes to work design or improved work practices. You'll see from the graphic on the slide that management commitment is central to effective risk assessment. A risk management approach that does not have executive support will flounder. Commitment to health and safety needs to come from the top and it needs to be reported at the executive level. So this slide shows you a range of current and upcoming ComCare resources that may also assist you to address and respond to psychosocial hazards and risks. This includes online and in-person training and education programs, guidance, toolkits and other materials. As I said earlier, ComCare will keep you informed as to any changes to the regulatory environment, and we'll also let you know when new resources become available via our website and e-news subscription services. Now I'm pleased to let you know that Comcare has established a dedicated psychosocial inspectorate team. This team will initially focus on proactive engagements with PCBUs and workers. Our objectives for the team are to understand psychosocial hazard and risk management maturity across our jurisdiction, to improve compliance through advice and guidance that prepares individual PCBUs and workers for upcoming legislative changes, to enable and assist duty holders to achieve evidence-based management of psychosocial hazards and risks, to support and build the capability of our inspectorate to regulate psychosocial risks and to develop an evidence base to inform priority areas for future training, guidance and resources. This team is currently piloting a series of proactive engagements with a number of PCBUs to test and refine our regulatory approach. We're really excited by this work and we believe it will meaningfully increase awareness of psychosocial risks and lead to greater compliance across our jurisdiction. While our preferred approach is to engage proactively and work with PCBUs to build awareness and capability, if it is determined that a PCBU is not taking appropriate steps to meet its statutory duties, Comcare can and will use other compliance powers. 
and this includes, where necessary, prosecutions. In fact, we currently have two prosecutions underway involving psychosocial matters. We will provide more information about the work of this team once the pilot is concluded. I'll move now to talk a little about COVID-19. Now, we continue to receive a significant number of WHS help desk queries relating to managing the risk of COVID in workplaces. PCBUs need to continually review and manage health and safety risks of COVID. Your COVID controls need to be reviewed and documented on an ongoing basis, and you need to ensure that workers are consulted regularly. The WHS Act requires PCBUs to ensure, so far as is reasonably practicable, the health and safety of workers, other staff, including contractors and volunteers, and other persons, such as clients, customers, and visitors to the workplace. Your COVID controls need to consider the risks to each of these groups. Given the emergence of new COVID-19 variants and fluctuating case numbers, employers must continue to monitor and manage the risks. You need to remain flexible and responsive to the evolving nature of risk. You cannot just set and forget your COVID controls. You will need to consider the diversity of working environments and workplace locations that you may have and ensure your responses are tailored following an assessment of risks. You will also need to comply with relevant public health advice and directions. Now, given the changing knowledge about COVID risks and the controls, Comcare will continue to review and update guidance on our website. In recent months, we've published new information on ventilation, vulnerable workers, and the management of risks following a workplace exposure. This guidance material points the reader back to managing risks according to the hierarchy of controls, with a focus on applying the most effective and achievable risk management approaches. The information on our website also includes links to relevant codes of practice and other useful guidance material. Now, we've recently seen an increase in queries through our help desk seeking clarification around whether an incident is notifiable under the WHS Act. Now, the notifiability of an incident may not always be clear at first glance, and notification requirements can be quite prescriptive. If you are within the Comcare scheme, it's worthwhile reviewing our Guide to Work Health and Safety Incident Notification. This outlines what is and what isn't notifiable, as well as site preservation requirements. We have a, we've had a mantra for a few years that continues to apply. If in doubt, please notify us. We appreciate that sometimes not all information about whether a matter arises from the conduct or undertaking of the PCBU is immediately known. We do strongly encourage PCBUs to notify as soon as practicable with the information that they have, as well as ensuring preservation of incident sites until site release can be directed by an inspector. Section 38 of the WHS Act requires a PCBU to ensure that Comcare is notified immediately after becoming aware that a notifiable incident that arises from the conduct of the business or undertaking has occurred. PCBUs must have procedures in place to ensure that workers are aware of the need to report WHS incidents promptly to those responsible for responding to them. So this might include management or your WHS team. Comcare is a 24-7 regulator, so we have inspectors on call in all states to assist with the timely response to notifications and incidents. And we will take a common sense approach to assessing whether Section 38 of the Act has been met by the PCBU. Be warned, however, that we will take and we have taken enforcement action for failures to comply with the duty to notify under Section 38 of the Act, including issuing improvement notices to PCBUs. PCBUs also have a duty under Section 39 of the Act to ensure, so far as is reasonably practicable, that the site where the incident occurred is not disturbed until an inspector arrives or directs otherwise, unless that disturbance is for a purpose outlined in Section 39.3 of the Act. Site preservation is important for the purposes of incident investigation 
and preventing further risks to others in the workplace. If you are unsure and would like to seek clarification on the notifiability of an incident or whether an incident site needs to be preserved, please call our WHS help desk for assistance. Moving on to contractor management. So this has been a priority area for Comcare for several years now. Comcare has commenced several prosecutions involving contractor management, and we are regularly involved in matters where PCBUs from multiple jurisdictions are involved. In May of this year, two of our Comcare inspectors presented a webinar on, com on contractor management, and they unpacked the concepts of shared duties and control. I would like to highlight just some of the key takeaways from this webinar. So contractor management is the process of overseeing work from start to finish that is being carried out under contract. This is often work of a specialised nature. We acknowledge that con contractor management isn't always clear cut and, can, sorry, and can be quite complex in nature. Under the WHS Act, workers are broadly defined as a person who carries out work in any capacity for a PCBU. So this includes contractors and subcontractors. The Act outlines the duties of workers, including contractors, and the meaning of shared duties. Commonwealth PCBUs, along with contractors and subcontractors, will have duties as PCBUs. Contractors and subcontractors can also be workers under the Act, and therefore will have worker duties too. These duties are not transferable. Effective contractor management requires clarity around roles and responsibilities, clarity around who has control of that work, and an understanding of who will notify of an incident. These expectations must be set out from the beginning of the contract and should be reviewed and maintained as required. Control of work is subject to the level of influence and control that the PCBU has over the specific work activities being undertaken by the contractors while on site. PCBUs must do what is reasonably practicable to eliminate or minimise the risks associated with those activities over which they have management or control. So have a look at the full recording on the Comcare website for further information about contractor management. Also, you can refer to Safe Work Australia's fact sheet on WHS duties in a contractual change, sorry, in a contractual chain that was released earlier this year. Now, I've spoken already about the importance of consultation with workers in the context of psychosocial hazards and COVID. Each year we receive many worker inquiries through our help desk for guidance relating to the consultation process. Communication and consultation are key to building a strong work health and safety culture. Under Section 47 of the Act, PCBUs have a duty to consult workers. PCBUs need to ensure that workers are consulted and involved in any health or safety matter that will or may affect them. I mentioned earlier on that workers can identify tasks or aspects of their work that cause or expose them to harm. They may have practical suggestions or potential solutions to address those hazards. If your workers feel their ideas and input are valued, they will generally have a stronger commitment to tackling such problems. All workplaces are different. There will be different types of work performed, differing risks across different workplaces. So accordingly, consultation will look different in each and every workplace. So that's all for me at this time, Megan. I might hand back to you. Happy to take some questions too. Thanks very much, Justin. Um, I think this might be a good time to ask a question that we've received earlier through the registration process because it matches some of what you've just talked about. And so the question is, what are better ways for consultation rather than being told this is what is happening? I think, Megan, the, um, the, the approach needs to be open and not a closed approach. And I've referenced in some of the, uh, the slides earlier on about some of the tools that exist uh, that help to identify particular risks and hazards in workplaces. So I think that's a good place to start with consultation too. To say, for instance, you know, this is the this is the guidance material. These are some of the identified hazards. Talk to your workers in an open way and say, do these apply to the particular type of work that you do? And then that leads to a conversation. I think about 
well, that's the risk identification piece, but what can be done to improve the work practice to address, minimise, ideally control, ideally eliminate those particular hazards and harm. So it needs to be that open, open process and you need to value the input of your workers. I think in some cases, workers might feel like the um, it's a it's a closed it's a closed conversation and it's consultation being sort of directed and driven uh, with a sort of limited a limited scope. I think if you can open up the conversation, it very much in, empowers uh, workers to be part of the solution. And I said in some of the commentary earlier about uh, health and safety culture in organisations being really critical. And if you can engage your workforce in in in, uh, in problem solving and um, uh, looking at the solutions as well, I think that will be um, you know, beneficial to both the workers and the business too. I mentioned some of the tools too. Um, Safe Work Australia has a code of practice on consultation, cooperation and coordination. Contains a lot of practical guidance. I think it's um it's on the slide there. Um, so uh, yeah, that's a really useful tool. Um, always there's a risk through consultation that disputes arise. So workers and HSRs need to be aware of dispute resolution processes. Comcare has some roles in relation to those matters. So um, contact us if there's concerns there. Um, so I think that's uh, that's a good place to start. It really ought to be, um, you know, uh, it could be an opportunity to have a really positive relationship in the workplace and um, and utilise it as a chance to engage your workforce um, and 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 problem solving, solution finding. Thanks, Ju thanks, Justin. Um, that's that was a great response. And just encourage you to put through any questions that you would like to start to think about. If anything raised any questions for you, happy for you to start to put those through um, to the chat. Um, and I think what we'll do now is perhaps go on to talking talk about some of um, some of Comcare's activities and initiatives that um, support creating healthy, health, mentally healthy workplaces. Um, so I'll start with Comcare's first prevention strategy that is um, due to be released later this year. The strategy is intended to be a coordinated pathway to support workplaces to prevent harm and enable a culture of health and safety, compliance and reporting. The prevention strategy outlines the top prevention priorities as body stressing, and this is in recognition that 42% of claims in the previous financial year were caused by body stressing, bullying and harassment, which contributed to 33% of mental stress claims in the last financial year, and work demands, which is the third priority. Our claims data indicate that there has been an 18% increase over the last three financial years. And we know that on average, psychological claims account for higher costs. So how will Comcare target these priority areas? With the changing nature of work, emerging workplace risks and new evidence in better practice, the strategy will maintain a strong commitment to the prevention of workplace harm and early intervention. We will work collaborative, collaboratively with the scheme and stakeholders to identify risks to work health and safety, prevent workplace harm and reduce its impact. We will encourage and support the scheme to interact with Comcare's prevention and early intervention focused programs, initiatives and services. And we will use data and evidence to drive systems focused approaches. I should also note that the identification of priorities in this strategy certainly does not limit Comcare's ability to focus on other risks and industries. You will see more targeted activities engagement on these topics in the future. So more broadly, Comcare offers a range of targeted activities, forums and resources for different stakeholder groups. The pandemic and shift to the virtual environment has allowed Comcare to broaden its depth and reach of engagement offerings. And you'll see on the slide some clips from just a couple of our virtual activities that we have offered in the past year. Our webinars alone have had over 5,000 registrations last year. And some of the other forums we offer on a regular basis include the Rehabilitation Case Manager Forum, the Claims Manager Forum, Workplace Rehabilitation Provider Forum, the Occup Occupational Rehabilitation and Medical Services Forum, and last week, we also held the Transport Network Forum, which is an industry-specific engagement activity. 
And twice a year, we hold a mental health community of practice, and we've had increasing attendance and numbers at those events. We encourage you to share these more targeted activities with the relevant people in your organisation and encourage them to get involved. As I mentioned earlier, we are offering further in-person events across the country for those within our scheme for Safe Work Month. We'd value your feedback on your preferences for forum events and networking sessions. So please reach out and let us know. In September, Comcare held the biannual Mental Health Community of Practice virtually. This group aims to bring together human resources and WHS practitioners to drive better practice in creating mentally healthy workplaces. The event is free to attend and you can subscribe to the mailing list through the Comcare events webpage. The most recent community of practice was titled Wellbeing Initiatives, Finding What Fits and, provide, and Provides the Opportunity for Attendees to Learn About Strategies to Mature Their Approach to Wellbeing and how to design mental health initiatives that fit their organisation. The full recording of the session is now available on Comcare's website. Other worker supports includes the New Access Workplaces trial that officially concluded last month. New Access Workplaces is a mental health coaching service that is an innovative model of care and focuses on prevention and early intervention of mild to moderate anxiety and or depression. The trial was available to 120,000 workers within the Australian Public Service Agencies and saw a strong recovery rate of 72% and also demonstrated improved worker wellbeing and productivity. The final evaluation highlights the effectiveness of new access workplaces in supporting the needs of employees, particularly as an alternative option to other mental health and wellbeing offerings such as EAP services. You can certainly read more about the evaluation findings on a summary on our website. Comcare is committed to building on the successful New Access Workplaces trial and is exploring op options to expand. Um, and next week, we have um, on Monday, the 10th of October, we have a web webinar scheduled with Georgie Harmon, the CEO of Beyond Blue. And if you've ever heard her speak, it's a real treat. Join us as she will talk about resilience, adaptability and mental health and how we can think differently to have a shift in human outcomes. During Safe Work Month, Comcare will also be launching a workplace mental health stigma awareness program called Mental Notes. The program recognises that psychological injury claims are increasing and often more complex to resolve compared to other injury types. Currently, 12% of Comcare claims are for psychological injury. Stigma is associated with having experiences of mental ill health and often is a barrier to seeking support and returning to work after injury. To effectively address this issue, focus needs to be on prevention and early intervention. This includes creating mentally healthy workplaces where mental health is not a taboo topic and can be discussed openly. Improving mental health literacy and skills will ensure workers are supported appropriately within their workplace. The Mental Health Notes initiative has three aims, which are on screen now. Awareness, education and behaviour change. The program will be made available through a dedicated website with resources such as a manager toolkit, guidance materials and editable creative assets like posters, email signatures, teams backgrounds and screensavers. The program tagline is everyday wellbeing at work. Some something Comcare hopes is the case for all workers within our jurisdiction. So keep an eye out for this program in October. Another new resource that was released recently, last week in fact, is a suite of animated videos on recovery and return to work for employees and employers across the scheme. These videos and accompanying fact sheets aim to improve understanding of the return to work process. They explain the health benefits of a safe, timely and durable return to work, roles and responsibilities, and better practices in supporting employees to return to work. Additionally, Comcare has worked with Safe Work Australia and the Behavioural Economics team of the Australian Government on resources that assist supervisors to support employee recovery and return to work. So please share the videos, fact sheets and supervisor resources within your networks. And briefly, to general practitioners, 
We know that GPs play an important role in supporting health and recovery for injured workers. And we just wanted to highlight that we have an upcoming, upcoming webinar with the Mental Health Primary Network on November 2, which is titled, Collaborating with the Workplace to Enable Good Work for Your Patient and Client. This will be a panel discussion with a psychologist, psychiatrist, and a GP occupational physician, also an employer representative. And it presents a case study that has a focus on psychological injury. And lastly, to wrap up before we move on to some more questions, on top of the resources and guidance I've shared, we also have training and self-paced learning available on our learning management system. To stay up to date, register for our e-news subscription and the emerging evidence alerts. This is a monthly newsletter that shares the latest research on, on the health benefits of good work, recovery at and return to work, and work health and safety issues. And don't forget to sign up for our upcoming Safe Work Month webinars I mentioned earlier. And please check out the do-it-yourself guide to hold Safe Work Month activities and safety conversations in your workplace. Justin and I will now move on to some more questions that we've received. And we'll start by answering some of those that were submitted when people registered. If you do want to think about, if you would like to, please add a question through the Q&A tab as well, and we can uh, endeavour to um, reach those too. Okay, so Justin, to bring you back into the conversation, one of the questions that's come through is how do we create safe and healthy remote workplaces? Yeah, thank you, Megan. Um, let's start with the uh, Safe Work Australia Code of Practice that I talked about a little earlier on, and that recognises remote work as uh, being one of those areas that uh, may lead to psychosocial harm. So. Uh, employers definitely need to be mindful of the impact of uh, remote workplaces and how that can play out. Um, I think in terms of uh, what an employer might do, I think engagement and that uh, consultation and communication with remote workers is critical. I think we saw through COVID as we all sort of moved and transitioned into remote work, the importance of that ongoing engagement with uh, people when they're not, um, you know, connected with the sort of normal workplaces. So uh, hopefully we've learned from that. Um, I know um, some of the engagement scores that we got at Comcare during those times were uh, higher than they've ever been through that very active engagement with, with workers, the provision of information, that ongoing communication. So I think that's a, you know, we can learn from, from that time and perhaps apply that too. Um, Comcare has teams across the country um, in, in all states and territories. And one of the things, for instance, that uh, we try to do through Comcare is to uh, engage and visit those sites, um, uh, uh, connect with those people, um, send, uh, bring them to, to events. I know in Comcare, again, we have a, an event for our inspectors called Moderator, where we bring them together once or twice a year, and I know that has enormous value for those people, particularly those who are sort of in our regional areas that we don't normally uh, engage with and they don't connect as frequently with others uh, doing similar work. I know there's real value in doing events like that. Um, clear processes in place as well for those people who are in remote workplaces to raise any issues or concerns that they might have. Very much, again, an open approach to that, um, a no blame culture, um, and really uh, encourage those connections, I think, uh, are important. I've spoken about, you know, the importance of a WHS management system and that risk assessment uh, activity, uh, looking then at the controls that can, that can be put in place, engage those remote workers in the identification of those particular risks, try to understand what are the drivers of uh, their concerns, and as I said earlier, involve them in the design of solutions. Are there ways that can, uh, or steps that measures that can be put in place to to mitigate and control those risks? So you know the principles that we apply to work health safety, having an effective safety management system, not having that set and fit, forget approach, engaging directly uh, through consultation and communication are just as important. I think they go some way towards addressing those particular particular risks. There are resources around as well. Safe Work Australia and Comcare has some materials as well that might be of assistance. Um, so hopefully that uh, that answers that question. Thanks, 
Thanks, Justin. There's a couple of questions that have come through. Um, there's a couple of questions that have come through the chat, a relatively easy one around the slide pack, so I can address that one first. So certainly this presentation is being recorded and we will also provide links to the resources on the website. Uh, it does take us a little while just to get the um, the settings right. So that takes um, probably a, you know a week or so for us to have that up onto the website. Um, I think also someone's also asked about links to posters on psych psychological hazards. And I think that's referring to the, the resources from Safe Work Australia, um, if that's what you're referring to. There are some resources from a posters perspective on the stigma um, program of work that will be launched in the first week of October. So I know we're in the first week, but probably, sorry, it'll be next week, thereabouts. Uh, so after the 10th is how we're planning to post, um, to, to send out that information. So look out for the stigma campaign and there'll be some links to posters on that. There are some psychological hazards and that might be what you're referring to, Susan. And I think that's available through um, Safe Work Australia. But again, we can um, put those links through uh, as part of this program so that you can easily um, refer to them. You could probably, uh, you could probably um, actually blow them up to A3 or, or something similar. There's actually a more difficult question, which uh, Justin, I might hand over to you. Um, what range of metrics do you see in the psychosocial space to monitor and measure performance? Good question, um, and not an easy one to answer, but I, I, I referred to uh, People at Work tool uh, is a good place to start if you're seeking to understand uh, the types of psychosocial risks that exist in your, in your organisations. I've referred also to the Safe Work Australia Code of Practice, and I think um, that that is a really good starting point, a resource to commence that uh, analysis that conversation with workers in relation to those particular risks and hazards that might exist and it might be possible to sort of establish a, a baseline uh, response to that and then measure performance over time. I also mentioned the psychosocial inspectorate team that we're establishing and um, part of that team's role will be to engage with our jurisdiction and to have that dialogue around psychosocial risks that exist inside the organisation. One of the things we're keen to be uh, to see is to gain a level of awareness, I suppose, about the maturity of the organisation's WHS management system as it relates to the psychosocial hazards. And, one, and out of that, I think we will gather a level of sort of uh, understanding of where uh, gaps exist in knowledge and best practice. And then we'll work with your team, Megan, to develop and design um, material, content, resources to assist um, to address that. So, um, yeah, I, I, it's an area where um, there's a lot of probably lag indicators. Um, lead indicators are important in this space. And I know in the sort of broader WHS community, there's a lot of activity going on to uh, identify and define some of those lead indicators. So I think we'll get a body of knowledge over time that that assists in answering that question. Um, a plug, if you like, for uh, another one of our webinars as part of um, National Safe Work Month. Sharon, uh, Professor Sharon Newnham is on uh, uh, presenting on Wednesday, the 26th of October, and she will talk about WHS systems, the future of work, um, and I'm sure that she'll touch on some of that uh, some of that knowledge and where where we're learning more about um, particularly you know the impact of psychosocial risk inside businesses, but what organisations can do to respond to that. Um, if your organisation has um, a, a employee census or something of that nature, if you're not already tracking um, psychosocial um, you know the, the, the attitudes and how people feel in terms of health and safety. And from the lens of psychosocial health, you could also implement some measures around that. Um, but I'd start with a code of practice and start to look at your organisation, monitor incidents as well. That's a really important data set that we often overlook. So, you know, there's requirements in the in the WHS Act to notify, and they're likely to see some changes and broader definitions down the track. But a, a really useful data set is looking at those particular incidents that might be occurring learning from those and tracking those over time. Um, so I'd be encouraging you to, to ensure that you've got some process to 
uh, monitor those incidents. Um, and and re uh, related to that, I guess, also is um, that no blame culture and trying to build mechanisms for people to raise issues or concerns, complaints, if you like, um, and bring to the fore any particular um, safety concerns they've got of a psychosocial nature and monitor monitor those as well. So I think, um, and there's no one size fits all answer to that question. It very much depends on the nature of work, the type of organisation that you do. You know, if you've got multiple sites, so you do need to be sort of thinking about designing a measure that's appropriate to the particular workplaces that you might have. Thanks, Justin. And yes, a really important question. And I think um, certainly there are some tools and resources already available, but I suspect this is an area that also will will evolve um, as this work continues. Um, and another question that's come through um, before the um, as part of the registration process, Justin. So I can um, ask you, please, what support can Comcare provide for organisations looking to improve safety outcomes? and enhance work health and safety understanding at all different levels. Yeah, thanks, Megan. So I've made some references to the materials that Comcare has on our website. Um, Safe Work Australia, the states and territory regulators, um, and there are a whole range of other uh, entities that provide really useful guidance and resources. So um, I think it's important that you reference those. Um, in terms of, I think, the question enhancing WHS understanding at all levels, I mean, the importance of safety committees, the role that HSRs play is really important. I mentioned, um, so there's a sort of bottom up approach there that you do need to engage your workforce. You do need to make, uh, make uh, highlight the important role that safety committees play. And, you know, through, through your various internal communication channels, there's an opportunity to promote that work. I also said that you know an effective safety system has that management commitment, and there's a really important role that management can play in in communicating the critical importance of safety to an organisation. And really, um, leadership teams, executive committees, and the like ought to be actively monitoring safety, and I think probably communicating um, performance across the business. Um, identifying the benefits of safety comes to mind as well. So there are um, proven, demonstrated um, economic and uh, social benefits of having a, an organisation that is committed to health and safety. And getting people to see uh, the benefits of speaking up, and I've, spoke, I've used the term no blame a few times, but you really want to build a safety culture where people feel like it's in their interest and in the organisation to raise these issues, to bring them to the fore, and for the organisation to have that mindset and commitment then to taking on board that, that information, that feedback, factoring it into their, their safety assessment through their safety management system and then designing responses. Um, safety champions can be really important. Uh, people who are, you know, speak up and are recognised and rewarded for that. Um, things like reward and recognition programs that identify good practice and um, acknowledge the important work that people Play, the safety champions, if you like, are, are, are useful too. Um, there are uh, um, surveys and the like that you could use throughout the year to uh, highlight the importance of hearing about safety uh, performance and any safety issues inside businesses. Um, you know, walking the walking was a, walk the um, <laughs> walk, walk the walk. Um, talk. I can't think of what that one is. I'm having a I you think it's me, walk Megan. the talk, isn't it? That's it. Thank you. Yep. Yes. Um, that's really important. So getting your yep. leadership out there on the floor and talking to people about safety, that's another way to do it. I mentioned with remote workers as well, going to the regions, ask people what they're finding. Mm. I think that just builds this mindset that safety is important to the business um, and take action in response to that. Um, consultation, communication are uh, critically important too, and mm. I think that helps to build that um, uh, that awareness and that, uh, you know, highlight the importance of safety. And stigma, sorry, one last, Megan, I've probably got another question, but stigma, destigmatise this reporting. Yeah. Encourage people to bring forward issues that they have and take an active, active response to those issues. Thanks, Justin. And I think you've touched on a few of the questions that have come through as well from, from the audience. So in particular around the value 
and purpose of consultation and representation by HSRs. And I think that's something that you did that you did touch on. Um, I don't know if you wanted to um, make any further comment around that, but um, it feels to me that you've, you've largely addressed that, but I'm not sure if you wanted to add anything else to that. Well, only that it's critical to a safe, effective safety culture. I think I've said that. It's yes, a really know. valuable source of information about safety. Um, they ought not be feared. Safety committees, HSRs play a critical role. Mm. Um, it's a role that's recognised in the legislation. Um, there are, if, if it's an area that um, you're struggling with or you want to know more about, there's plenty of guidance. Safe Work Australia's website and ours. I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thanks, Justin. Another question on um, some time frames. So are there any time frames on when the psychosocial inspectorate will be engaging the jurisdiction on psychosocial risk and the maturity of safety systems? And a shout out to Kevin. St. Mark. Oh, Kevin. How are you, Kevin? Kevin used to work <laughs> with us. Um, yes, so we've got a trial underway, a pilot. So uh, that team is, is engaging with a number of jurisdictions, a number of entities in the jurisdiction, I should say. Um, We've got an approach that we're we're trialling at the moment, and we're very keen to learn about how that works. And uh, really, you know, uh, is it benefiting the PCBU? Because we really want this program to be um, to work with PCBUs to assist uh, raise awareness and levels of understanding and capability across the psychosocial space. And then, from our perspective as the regulator, for us to then understand where the jurisdiction's at, understand if there are any gaps in, in knowledge, if there are, uh, to, to identify areas that we can um, design and provide more information to assist the, uh, the PCBU. So um, that trial's underway, the pilot's underway. I, um, all going well, we'll be rolling it out more broadly in the coming months. So haven't got an exact time frame, but um, it's imminent. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. There is a question from the audience, relatively technical in nature, and it might be best addressed to someone else, but perhaps I will ask it, Justin, and then you, you could maybe be able to refer on. So how could we go about adding psychosocial health as a specific part of S19 of the WHS Act? Do we call it out as its own line in our primary duty? Just wanted to flag that because it's come through, but maybe for you to make a comment on perhaps um, on what you think around where that best sits. Yeah, well, these are matters that Safe Work Australia is considering at the moment, and they certainly came out of the Boland review that I referred to earlier. Um, so if, uh, if, if the um, questioner has a has a particular interest, I um, encourage them to have a look at uh, that that uh, well both the Boland review and some of the work that. Safe Work Australia has done in response. So I won't, um, the way this works, there are model laws. I touched on this at the outset that um, are developed uh, through the Safe Work Australia process and the various jurisdictions then um, pick those up and, um, and, and enact them. So I can't give you, um, you know, more detail than that, other than to say that these, the issues that I think were raised have been addressed um, through those, through those, um, through the Bolan review and the work of SWA. I think we'll see over time also a broadening of notification provisions um, and a requirement from PCBUs to notify regulators of particular psychosocial risks. Um, what that looks like is still being worked through from the SWA process and certainly we'll, we'll be keeping up to date on any developments in that space. So there is activity underway that I think goes towards addressing that question. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Justin. Um, probably got time for another um, one more question. So this is one that came through the registration process. So um, the question is, I'm interested in the ergonomic setup of vehicles as workplaces where electronic and communications devices are an integral part of that work. And a related question on the best way organisations can reduce the incidence of workers' compensation claims for joint and muscle pain. Sounds okay. like a transport network forum one as well. Yeah, it does. Yeah, you're going to plug our transport network forum too. That's good. Um, look, you noted, I think, in the um, uh, prevention strategy that um, we've developed that musculoskeletal injury is still the number one injury type, and I think it's growing. Did I hear 11% of 
I think it's more than that. I think it's more than that. But 42%. Yeah. So, well, it was an increase, though. I think so. It continues to increase. So, I'd look at this question through that lens. What, um, you know, as an ergonomic question, uh, what what are you you can undertake an ergonomic analysis of the particular type of work that's undertaken, um, and see whether there are ways to design solutions to address that. This is the approach that you ought to be taking to all musculoskeletal injuries, um, and it fits with the, the, the you know the, the the commentary that I've made today about the importance of risk assessment design of controls and the like. So I'd certainly be starting there. Um, we learned from our Transport Network Forum that um, there's been some really positive um, achievements made by some, uh, some players in that industry by looking and working with truck drivers, for instance, on how they get in and out of cabins, how they load vehicles, uh, what, in, you know, what stresses those activities are putting on particular parts of the body and seeing whether uh, you can design through training or through some sort of engineered process, potentially um, a better way to do that, that minimizes injury. Now, key to that is, again, consulting with workers, involving them in the problem solving and looking at it as a, as a particular workplace hazard and then a design piece. Um, I know also that, you know, stretching and um, uh, giving people um, knowledge and skills to reduce uh, the impact of those those injuries you know if it's a requirement of the job that people have to get in and out of cars and have to stretch and you know crane their necks and do whatever what can you do as a preventative piece and assist the workers um, to to understand those particular approaches that might reduce the risk of of injury and again engage the people you know like people don't want to be off work and injured and people don't want to have crook backs and all the rest of it. And if you can build that culture whereby you work actively with those workers to design um, responses to those particular hazards, I think that might go some way to, to minimising um, and, and, and addressing that as a, as a particular injury type. Yeah, thanks, Justin. And I guess, as you noted, it is one of the three priority areas as part of our prevention strategy. And as such, we will be looking at that more closely over the duration of that strategy and um, and putting out some additional information in regards to the reduction of um, of uh, of injuries around um, body stressing. Um, so, so thank you for that. Um, I think we're essentially um, on time. So um, thank you very much for all the questions that have come through. So I just would like to um, take a minute for some closing remarks, if I could. So there's been a lot of information today, and I know that we've done a little bit of the talking, um, and it was really great to have those questions, both through the registration process, but also um, as they came through in the, in the live Q&A. So thank you very much for your participation and interest. We hope that you can take a moment to reflect on the session, and perhaps to look at what are some of the things you can um, follow up on, so read, have a look into, or consult and share with your work, work with your work group and colleagues moving forward. We thank you for your attendance and also, as I said, for your participation and interest and have a really terrific um, rest of the day and stay safe.